Art is essential. We shall not be moved. Art is essential. We shall not be moved just like a tree standing by the water. We shall not be moved. City College is not listening. They're not listening to what it is that students need, that teachers need, that the citizens of San Francisco have said that they need. We're here because we are all City College and whatever is happening here is affecting each and every one as individuals and as a city group. Amen. So, yes, I thank you. today Hello. you're going to be hearing from several speakers on the different elements of City College that have been affected negatively and are being affected. And so we want people to really understand these effects. And that will come from people who are going to be speaking to that. So we're going to have two people, Harry Bernstein and Madeline Mueller. Uh, Madeline will be on Zoom talking about Balboa Reservoir. And as you well know, that is that area, the parking area right across from the main campus that is essential for parking areas for the students. Uh, not to have that would really negatively impact the college. All right, so that's one person. All right, then Civic Center. The ESL students, the ones who are struggling right now to learn English so that they can get jobs and survive in San Francisco, that is, going, that is under attack and they're thinking about closing that center. Then the next, the next center that that we're looking at is has to do. That's the Evans Center, and the Evans Center it has classes that um, support the trades. We de that uh, we definitely need more classes there and there are fewer now than there were before. So we see that there are cuts affecting Evans. So that's another uh, group. Then we have the Affirmative Action Task Force. The task force at City College needs reinforcement, needs support of the administration to grow their program and they are not getting it. So we will have a speaker on that as well. Yeah. You need to see, we all need to understand and appreciate how these individual cuts are affecting all of us as a whole. And it is absolutely essential for people to reach out, to talk to uh, the Board of Supervisors, to talk to the Board of Trustees and say, this is not tolerable. We're not going along with this. They are supposed to be our representatives and we're not gonna sit back and allow them to chip away, chip away, chip away until we have nothing. So at the end of the program, <clears throat> I will. we have handouts with all the information, contact information, for you to use so that you can contact people and say, no, this is just not right with what's going on. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> Fort Mason, for those people who don't know, aren't familiar with it, houses a couple of programs. 80% of the classes at Fort Mason were art classes. And I'm saying were because as I speak, Teachers are moving out of their classrooms. All right, 80%. Now, the idea was that they were going to move the classes, move the program someplace else. 
at another center or centers. There is no way that they're going to move what we know as the biggest kiln in the Bay Area. We have it right here. That kiln was built inside the area. They didn't bring it in from the outside, they built it in. The only way to get it out of there is to disassemble it. And you, we know they're not going to reassemble it. We know that. So that's not really true that they're going to move the program, the sculpture program someplace else. It's just not happening. Um, there's, for those of you who know a, a little bit about sculpture, there's a process called raccooning. Raccooning is, it can be very unsafe unless it's someplace near water or near, as uh, far away from other buildings. That's why we can have raccooning here, and you can't have it in Chinatown at that center, nor can you have it in the Mission. It's not going to work. It won't be safe. So there goes the raccooning. So when they say, we're going to move your program elsewhere, no, it's not going to happen. All right, upstairs on the second floor, there are six printing presses, some of which were purchased from the proceeds of art shows that take place at Fort Mason once a year, the holiday show. They made for, um, City College collects 15% of the sales, of the student sales, and they purchased a couple of presses uh, with that money. All right, there are six presses, each one of which weighs approximately 1,500 pounds. Now, don't tell me they're going to move six presses someplace else and set it up. It's not going to happen. So all I'm saying to you right now is be aware when you hear from, from a board of, you know, somebody on the board of trustees that don't worry, we're moving the program. All right, now, are they maybe moving some of the drawing classes? Yes. Can they move a watercolor class? Yes. Can they move a sculpture class? No. How about a printing class? No. All right. Um, we have a wonderful art school here. We need to stay here. We can help so many people. Right. Right. Okay. The, uh, um, we have also housed here Three classes, OLAD classes, Older Adults Program. Um, it was made very clear by administration that OLAD is not a priority. So you have seniors here that, have, uh, that love the classes, that are devoted to the classes, who show up all the time. So you've got the enrollment. And uh, to just say that this is not a priority when we know that the numbers of seniors in California, according to the governor, are going up and there'll be eight point now, I'll just say eight million more seniors uh, by 2030. That's not that far away. What, and the governor, Governor Newsom, wants California to be a leader in the area of treating seniors respectfully. It is not respectful to di d disseminate their program, to tell them that they're not a priority. That's not respectful. I don't think that's what the governor wants. I don't think that's what we want. So that's the other thing. All right. So we're trying very hard to protect OLAD. But right now, 90% of that OLAD program has been cut. 90%.
Now, we've all experienced cuts to our different programs, not 90%. So you know for a fact, just from that, we're not wanted. OLAD is not wanted as part of the program. So people, I think, will be speaking to that later. So uh, with that, I want to thank you very much for being here. We are City College. Should we have a song? No. Not, not a song right now. All right. Um, I'm going to move on right now to our next speaker who will give you a little bit more information. And that will be, well, we'll start with Peter Warfield. I'm Peter Warfield with a group called, I'm a former student uh, at Fort Mason in the older adult program. A former student because they cut 52 out of 58 older adult classes, including both of the art classes that I was taking uh, in the fall and wanted to take in the spring. Uh, that's more than 90% of the older adult program uh, at City College, and it leaves only six classes in the older adult program, which a year and a half ago had some 76 or 78 classes altogether. We consider that to be really serious age discrimination. Yes. Yes. And we don't like it and we don't think it's right. Uh, all of this was done on practically no notice. The week before Thanksgiving, the Chancellor, the former Chancellor Rocha sent out a letter saying that uh, there were going to be serious cuts. Altogether, 300 classes were cut from the overall spring program. Uh, again, that's a huge cut, and that's not helping anybody get an education in any category of student. Now, the chancellor said that um, the cuts were due to low enrollment, that they chose low enrollment classes. Certainly both of the classes that I've attended were over-enrolled, uh, fully enrolled, and the head of the older adult program said that the older adult classes were very well and fully enrolled. Uh, they said there was a qu an issue of money. Well, There's some serious questions about their uh, financial information. So for example, the teachers and the extension program last fall after the cuts arranged to have the extension program do the same classes in sculpture and drawing, figure sculpture and figure drawing, as pay classes. And the teachers had all the enrollment and all the checks in hand for full enrollment and then the word came from above, no. They would not go ahead with extension classes here at Fort Mason. Uh, that would basically be the equivalent of older class, of the previous classes, but were for pay. So where is this, where is this business about money? We also, of course, know that the former chancellor wrote to the supervisors when the supervisors were willing to give millions of dollars so that there could be spring classes full schedule with no cuts. And the chancellor actually wrote a letter saying, no, we don't need the money, we don't want the money, we're not going to use the money if you give it to us. Uh, I do want to repeat that uh, my group, uh, Equity for Older Students, can be reached at equity for older students at protonmail.com. Uh, again, equity for older students at protonmail.com. I repeat that because that's something that I usually repeat when I make public comment at the Board of Trustees meetings. But they have managed to make minimal transparency at every possible level. Uh, as, as as has done the administration. So we heard that the administration, when it cut 300 classes in November, the day before, the night before, they call it the Midnight Massacre, the night before registration began, they did not consult deans, they did not consult chairs, and they certainly didn't consult the students. 
at the Board of Trustees, there is a whole process of disenfranchisement of the public. So for example, for a while with their Zoom meetings, sorry about the mask, the Zoom meetings would read the public comments that people submitted by email, but they consistently removed my mention of the email address for Equity for Older Students. They also cut portions of my comments that I had written to them and that were plainly part of my public comment. Their whole public comment process is constantly changing and in many respects illegally uh, sabotaging the public's right and ability to be heard. The law says they're supposed to provide public comment at every agenda item when it comes up. They don't do that. They've now gone to taking public comment at the very beginning, supposedly, of the meetings. Do they have them the comments at the beginning of the meeting so as to satisfy the law, public comment before or during their consideration? No. They approve the minutes without any public comment as item two or three, and then they take public comment on everything at item four or five. They have a whole range of ways of sabotaging the public's ability to comment or even the public's right to comment. In December, at the December meeting, I wrote my name and submitted a speaker card like everybody else. But they actually tried to stop me. You can watch the meeting at which they try and say, well, you already had public comment. I said, no, I wanted public comment on every agenda item and that includes things on the agenda and things off the agenda. And they eventually, thanks to lots of people in the room and some of them yelling, let him speak, they let me speak for my one minute. So, one minute each at the December meeting because there were so many people who were outraged by what they were doing. So the Board of Trustees and their selected Chancellor are doing things not only that are bad, wrong, and poor policy, there's not a good explanation of what the reasons are. The reasons seem to be full of holes at best. But they're also doing their best in every realm, including their meetings, not to follow the law and not to give people their due with respect to considering what they have to say. So we think that making a noise where possible and where it might do some good is very useful. Merrily already mentioned, get in touch with your supervisors. City College is a real asset for the city that's being destroyed. Not only the older adult program, all the classes with a particular focus on the arts, on English as a second language and so on. You've heard some of the other cuts. Uh, we also think if you get in touch with the mayor and our state representatives, that would be helpful as well because the state is the primary funder of City College. So I hope that working together, we can all get City College back to the community college that serves everybody and not just a stripped down, uh, reduced version that just barely gets people through college who only need to get a degree or transfer to a four-year institution, but rather does what community colleges were supposed to do, and that is to serve everybody in the community. Thank you. I'm Jean Cherie. I'm part of uh, Tebby's older adult life modeling class and uh, just packing it and just crying and um, this is really sad and uh, it is a time when we really need art. All of you should be home making art. So, but at least we get to see each other for this, so this is really a wonderful opportunity for us to be here. But we need to be creative at this period of time. This is a fantastic place to be creative. We do not need to cut a, another art uh, opportunity. 
uh, creative time out of our lives. So it's good to see all of you here and um, keep the changes that we want in mind. This will go bigger and better and be creative. Thank you. Step up and say something. Can anybody hear me with all this stuff on? No. Yeah. Is it working now? Yeah. Okay. Um, years ago, don't touch it. Okay. Years ago, can anyone hear me now? Speak up. Uh, it's nice to see you all. You're such a wonderful class. You all showed up. It's really wonderful. And, um, you know, years ago, they had that performing arts building. They passed a bond with the citizens to um, earmark millions of dollars for the Performing Arts Building. Now, it was supposed to go out at Ocean Campus. It was a beautiful place for theater, the arts. I'm sure there would have been a place for the kill. Now, what happened over the years is they must have frittered the money away. No, no. They hid it. Where did they put it? It was no. supposed to build a building. They didn't. They, they weren't transparent. They now they're privatizing it. Oh my gosh. Well, it was supposed to be a huge fund. They had plans. They had architecture plans. They could put the art, uh, art students in, the theater students and the music students. And I'm sure if somebody would have built a place for the art students, they would have had the kiln area. So they should really look into that matter, what happened to the money and why they didn't build that. So I want to bring that up. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. Okay. And introduce yourself. That's where okay. they were supposed to Hi, I'm Leslie right. Smith, and I work for City College for. Close to the mic. Close to the mic. But don't touch the mic. <laughs> don't touch the mic. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Great. Okay. So my name is Leslie Smith. I worked for City College for 30 years and fought for good public policy. So I'm here today to read the resolution that we need all of you to call the or email the City College Board of Trustees asking them to rescind their action of 12, 30, 12 o'clock in the morning um, last month closing the Fort Mason campus. So, so I want to go back to 1879. 1879, the California Constitution put in the Constitution that we cannot have civil liberties and rights without access to education. So we have to stand here and fight to keep the doors open for everyone in San Francisco, not just the select few. The California Education Code, which is the law that governs how community colleges work in California, says that the mission of the California Community Colleges is to provide educational and opportunity and success to the broadest range of our citizens, not a narrow group. It goes on to specifically say opportunity for all qualified Californians and it specifically says both younger and older students. That's the law. We need to follow the law. Furthermore, City College itself, by law, is required to put together an educational master plan. In fact, it cannot collect any money from the state without doing so. So it put together a master plan to cover 2018 to 2025. And it says that the specific overarching goal is to get back to 32,000 full-time student equivalents. Now, I worked here for 30 years. I was in the Office of Governmental Relations. I headed up research. And we served 100,000 San Franciscans for decades because we reached out to every single community to serve and educate and create a solid, educated society in San Francisco. We are now down to 37,000. We have lost nearly two-thirds two of our students. Why? Well, closing Fort Mason is going in the opposite direction. The Board of Trustees 
own goals say that their top priority is to get back the number of students because it's the only way to continue to serve San Franciscans who vote for us every single time because that is how important education is to the adults in San Francisco. So we need to ask, why are you closing Fort Mason? The state pays us to provide education in other sites. They give us money, it's called basic apportionment, to not just have every single class at Ocean Campus. They pay us so that everybody doesn't have to spend hours in their car, hours on the bus, hours commuting when they could actually be in the classroom learning in their community with all the diversity of all the different neighborhoods. We had more art classes in San Francisco, City College of San Francisco covering every single culture in the world. We had Chinese art history and Chinese American art history. We wanted to talk to all of our students and respect all cultures and there are no great societies in the world without great art. And we're, we're shutting that all down. We're, ta we're narrowing the curriculum. I think we're going back to Western art is the only thing that matters. It's just, it's wrong. You know, painting isn't the only art form. What happened to metal sculpture? So, they say they want to do this in their own goals. Why, and you need, you need to ask them. We've been asking, Peter talked about the process. We need the public to pressure to get them to overturn their actions. So we know that city, San Francisco's population is growing. Why is the enrollment at City College collapsing? Well, it's because we're shutting down sites. We're canceling classes. We're losing the diversity of our curriculum. We're not serving everybody. We're targeting a small group of students. They want them to go full time. Community college students always, 85% are always working. They're the working poor. You need to work and go to school. You can't stop, go full time. That's some other world. Okay, so we are asking, we talked to the Fort Mason administration. They're willing to work with us. The state is currently giving us $354,000 a year to pay the lease. We're off about $50,000. Fort Mason has agreed to close the gap. Why are we closing Fort Mason? Why? So you need to, so we have a resolution. You need to look at it. You need to look in the social media. And we have a handout that gives you the, the uh, resolution in writing so you can read it, so you're informed when you make the call or put it in the email. And it says, to be resolved that the Board of Trustees of City College of San Francisco directs the Chancellor to open negotiations immediately to extend the lease. Yes. Stop yes. the move out. Stop the move out. The second thing is then you need to get into a long-term lease because if you get into a 10-year lease, then you have bond dollars to do the earthquake retrofit. You can take it Fort Mason and you can commit to it. The state has paid us for Fort Mason the entire time we've been here for 45 years. It's time that we serve the students, stop the shutdown, open the doors. We all need education. Thank you. Hello, I hope some of you know who I am, but if not, I'm Conrad Dutton. I teach and am a student at Fort Mason. I just wrapped up my packing. Um, they initially gave me 15 minutes to pack up, but then eventually decided I could use a little more time to pack up my stuff. I've te taught for 10 years or more and have been taking classes for even longer. The, the amazing thing is, you know, is that this has been here for so long and it has run on its own and there's been money coming in from left and right as you've heard before and this covert operation that's happening now is a long history of trying to do what shouldn't be done which is shutting down Fort Mason. We had this three years ago if you'd remember 
um, with the same flimsy ideas. Now, of course, they have the pandemic and other crazy stuff going on that takes attention away from what's happening here. And they are truly taking advantage of everything else that's going on to really stick a knife to us and, and call this place a day, I, I hope. Um, that they recognize that they are not serving the community anymore, that the people that are paying their wages um, in the administrative body are the people that they are disenfranchising. They are the people that have reared them as infants and are now seniors and older adults that deserve a community of their own to uh, uh, to extend their lifelong learning in an environment that is dignified and and beautiful instead of being somehow warehoused off in a corner somewhere in some campus that is willing to take up whatever they can, which of course in this case means none of the stuff we have here will go. The big kilns for the figurative sculpture, the spaces that we have for the painting and the work we do doesn't exist anywhere else that I am aware of. And of course, for many, that will mean they'll, move, they'll have to commute across the entire city. So, uh, so much disrespect and so much disregard and so much covert operation all in one is hard to believe. And we just have been, you know, we've been paying their wages. We have been enabling the school to exist through our own taxes and the initiatives that we have all said yes to. I do not understand why they're saying no to those that have so long supported them. Um, I, it's really, um, it's hard to say all this without getting uh, enraged and upset. Um, it's, it's, uh, I, I hope we can continue our path one way or another, we will continue fighting and, and make something happen. Um, I, hope, I hope you're all here for whatever's going to be happening next because it's not going to stop at this point, okay? Yeah. All right. My name is Art Persico. I'm a reti retired Teamster and a current convener of the SF Grey Panthers. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Um, I've taken classes right here in silk screening, and I've taken other classes at City College of San Francisco in labor studies. Fred, Fred Glass, great teacher. I hope they can bring him back. We should be demanding things from, you know, power doesn't yield without a demand. Uh, I'm in the Great Panthers, and we, uh, we specialize in outrage, and there's a lot to be outraged about right now. Uh, we're Great Panthers are particular fans of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And this week is the 75th anniversary of the founding of the United Nations in San Francisco. 1945, it happened right here. So we have a special place in uh, UN history and the Universal Declaration of, of Human Rights is something that Great Panthers really uh, pay attention to and would like to see implemented and it's relevant to City College. There are several clauses in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that relate to City College and its role in educating and culture for the wider community. Article 27 says, everyone has the right to freely participate. Let me, let me find my place here. Let's start with Article 19 in chronological order. Everyone has the right of freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontier. Article 26 says, in part, everyone has the right to education. Education shall be equally accessible to, for all and shall be directed to the full development of the human personality. Article 27 says, everyone has the right to freely participate in the cultural life of the community and to enjoy the arts. The San Francisco Gray Panthers, City College of San Francisco, as fulfilling an obligation to us as, as just 
for people who live in San Francisco under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Therefore, we want it to be known and, and make sure that older adults in San Francisco and everybody has access to such programs. To see this very valuable program at Fort Mason for the arts that older adults in San Francisco have enjoyed for 40 years being put under threat is unconscionable. And this campus is unique. Look at it. Look where we are. One of the things that makes Fort Mason exceptional for the arts is to have, it has the largest pottery kiln in the Bay Area. It's so large that it's too large to move. It sends out a lot of heat, and at Fort Mason, it's near the bay so that it's safe. You can only have Raku, which is Japanese pottery making at high heat, in a safe place. You could never do it in Chinatown or in the Mission because the buildings are too close together and the risk of fire would be too great. Another thing that makes Fort Mason campus unique is that you have printing presses and art studios on multiple floors. So seniors can access them. The parking lot's nearby. They can carry things into and out of the buildings with elevators. It's, uh, it's, it's important for older adults especially. They have good access. If they moved it, it would be much different. The bottom line, as a lot of people like to refer to, is important as well. And this has been explained in earlier that the uh, older adults have access to fewer classes and it'll prove that we're not a priority if they move this, these classes from Fort Mason. The administration at City College will lose money by doing this. They will lose the money from the state of California, but they're not moving the classes for older adults by getting out of Fort Mason. They're eliminating them. Yeah. Uh, They've been trying for years to make City College into a STEM college and the arts are no, uh, no longer fit into their vision of City College. Let's make City College fit our vision. Yes. Yes. Let's demand that. Yes. So let's do everything we can to save or restore City College in San Francisco, Fort Mason, as a center for art activity for everyone, including older adults. Thank you. My name is Steve Zeltzer. I'm with Heat and uh, I'm with Work Week Radio and have been doing covering the issue of protection of public education. And it really is scandalous in one of the wealthiest cities in the world with, with 75 billionaires that they don't have money for keeping our public community college going. That's what they're saying. And it, it, they say it's a question of money. That's what they've been arguing. It's not a question of money because they have a lot of developers, they have a lot of high executives that they keep hiring. You know, I remember Rocha said, uh, I came from an earthquake at Northridge, and we should have an a, a, a executive on earthquakes, how to take care of earthquakes. So they hired an executive at probably over $200,000 on how to take care of earthquakes, but they didn't have the money to keep this place going, to stop this destruction of City College. So it's a hypocrisy, it's duplicity, but it really has been going on for many years. It didn't start here. The trusteeship was organized to prevent the uh, construction of the, the uh, Performing Arts Education Center. They stopped it. Even though it was illegal, they should have completed it because we, the people of San Francisco, voted money for it. So what they're saying, to hell with the people of San Francisco. We have other priorities. So who is really running City College? That's what I would like to know. Who are these people listening to? As Leslie pointed out, they're actually losing money by closing this uh, St. Fort Mason Center. So who are they listening to? To. When we have told them the facts, the information about it, they just ignore it. In fact, not one member of the Board of Trustees even asked a question about these financial issues. I mean, can you imagine that? Out of all the Board of Trustees, not one said, well, let's look at the figures. We've been provided some information that we're going to get money to the state to keep this thing going. Why should we ask? Why don't we do, why don't we do that? Why don't we keep this thing going? The reason is, 
is that this is part of the privatization agenda in San Francisco. They want you to go to art class if you can afford two or three thousand dollars to go to art classes. That's what they're saying. The art, the private privatization of public education is what this is about. They're selling off the campuses to developers. In fact, the city of San Francisco is spending millions of dollars, millions of dollars, to sell off Avalon, uh, the uh, Balboa Reservoir, and turn it over to Avalon. Now, who voted for that? Nobody. Who voted to privatize the reservoir, which is needed by working class students so they can go to City College? Who voted to privatize it and, and build million dollar condos uh, next to uh, City College? Uh, the, the, our position has to be public land for the public's use. That's our position, you know. And this, this treasure, this beautiful treasure that we have here at Fort Mason should not be destroyed. That is a priority to protect these treasures that have been built up over many decades by the people of San Francisco. They fought to make this thing happen, and they're just voting it away without a thought to the effect on the students. And when we talk, it's corruption, and when we talk about seniors, you know, the number of seniors in San Francisco, we have a high proportion of seniors. They need this. They need this for their health and safety. They need, they need it, and they have a right to go to a, uh, studies and programs for, with teachers and to be educated. And what they did is they tried to privatize that. They tried to outsource it to nonprofit centers where non-union teachers would be there. What is that? Well, you know what that is? That is union busting. We have a faculty here that is educated, that is trained, that is certified. They spent their lives developing their skills, and they're going to outsource it to nonprofits? where they don't even have any training. Again, it's contempt for the people of San Francisco. It's union busting. So we have uh, some important work to do here. We have to educate the public that this is fraudulent. What they're, clo what they're using as an excuse is a lie. We have to say that. It's a lie. You're lying. You're not telling the truth to the public. We have to demand that this privatization stop. The Planning Commission is packed with developers and people who represent the developers. This, the PUC is packed by developers. They're going to sell the property at, at uh, Balboa below market value, $11 million. And they're saying, well, they're doing that for working class housing. What about working class students who need City College? The priority of City College is to protect City College. The priority of public land is is to protect the public, not developers who have an agenda to profit, profiteer off of privatization of public land, because that's precisely what's going on. So we have to call on the Board of Supervisors to reject the Planning Commission recommendation of the sale of this. We have to get candidates who are going to support the public, who are going to support Fort Mason, and demand that we have a right to a great public education, and we can afford it in San Francisco. There are, and the state of California including our elected officials, have voted to change the laws for community colleges to punish working class students that can't afford to finish college in two years. They changed the funding ratio. Now, a lot of working class students have to work two and three jobs. How can they afford to finish in two years? It's only students with more means, middle class or upper class, who can finish in two years. It's not working class students. So they changed the funding formula so this college and all colleges in California are punished financially unless they finish in two years. This is reactionary. It's anti-working class. Young people who don't have any money, and most of them don't, have a right to a public education. And when we talk about the millions of people in California un unemployed, where are they going to go? What are they going to do? They should be going to college. They should be developing their skills. Young people need a future. Young people are angry. Black working people, black people are angry because they've been disenfranchised. They're stealing their public their public education. They're stealing their, their, their health care. We in California have to protect our public services. This is also racist. They're closing down the ethnic studies program. They do, they, it's a big fight to even have a professor at Black Studies here at, at, at City College. What kind of city is this? What kind of priorities do these people have? Ethnic Studies was built by the strike in San Francisco State, and now they want to destroy, destroy the Ethnic Studies program. They want to tell people you shouldn't learn about your history. You shouldn't learn about the real struggles in California. I think that's reactionary, it's racist, and we have to put a halt to it. It's outrageous. And we have to stand with the community, we have to stand with labor, and all working people. We have a right to a public education. We demand it. We have a right to a beautiful future because this is a beautiful country and this is a beautiful campus. Solidarity, we defend our, our Fort Mason. I'm Sue Englander. I'm a history teacher in the social science department. I was laid off this year, but I'm back.
And I'm going to teach a little history today. I'm a woman of few words, and I jumped the line. Sorry about that. But um, 2012, when accreditation, uh, deaccreditation began against City College, we were the flagship campus of the community college system through deaccreditation and then through Roach's nasty strangling regime we have lost 30,000 and more students. So it started in 2012 with deaccreditation and this is where we are now. This is no coincidence. We are being targeted by evildoers who want to take down community college who want to take down the community college system, who want to privatize education, not just Fort Mason, they want to privatize education. And we have been pushing back for eight years. I am working my last nerve on this. When I go back to class, and it's going to be online, I'm teaching a, a history class starting in 1600 with Native America and going to the Civil War, but I'm also going to be teaching about the history of American education, of U.S. education. What has happened, why we fought for it through the 1700s, through the 1800s. And in my women's history class, I'm going to say how we fought for it for women in the 1800s and the 1900s to let people know that this is a 300-year struggle, and we're not going to stop now. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Jess Wynn, and I'm a City, Col City College student, and I'm a proud member of the CCSF Collective. More and more students are speaking up and protesting about things that matter to them, like Black Lives Matter. With the recent loss of Sean Montetorosa, it reminds us of the loss of a former, another former CCSF student, Alex Nieto. Yes. And it's important for us to all stand together to seek justice for Sean. His sisters are asking for the community's help to um, ask the Vallejo PD to release the body cam footage and also the dashboard cam footage from that incident. And we want to make sure that we get justice for all our students. Yeah. No matter if you're a RAM, one point in time, you're always part of the RAM family. As part of a CCSF student, I would like to take this moment to amplify the needs and the demands of our Black Student Union. Earlier today, Patricia Noonley, a faculty member, a part of the Affirmative Action Task Force, has been advocated for a full-time faculty hire for the African American Studies Department. They only have two part-time teachers. They don't even have a full-time teacher for that department, which is such a shame. City College has one of the oldest African American Studies Department in the nation and it's because of the the protest back in the 1950s that we were able to have that department as you can see down below we put uh, the demands for the black student union on poster board but we also have a link tree uh, link that you can all sign and um, support the demands of our students we want a fully funded african-american resource center yes. create an african-american studies associate of arts degree for transfer yes. we want to create a unified space for the African American Resource Center, for the African American Studies Department, for AMUJA, the African American Scholars Program, as well as the Black Student Union. Having a unified space will allow for all the services to work together and for students to build community and get the space that they deserve. They're not even listed on the campus maps at all for Resource Center, and that's 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 unacceptable, especially in this time when the trustees are talking about equity. We want them to show up our action and doing it now. We don't want to wait till spring of 2021 in order to get a full-time faculty hire for them. The fa full-time faculty hire should be in fall. So then the teacher can go and build relationships with students and students can build that community in order to be heard and in order to get their academic goals achieved. Um, it's important for us to go band together to follow the student groups, to follow the different advocacy groups, to get involved and to take action now. As a student, I am appointed as the 
facilities representative and I'm only one of two students in a group of a lot of admin, faculty, and classified staff. And we need your help to amplify the needs of our students and to ask for the accountability from our trustees who promise us the world but has not delivered us anything. Um, the most important thing is please follow our students' accounts at CCSF Collective on Instagram. Get involved. We're trying to educate the community on what issues are happening at City College so then you can make informed decisions in November on who you would like to vote for a trustee. Um, I would like to take this moment to introduce the next speaker. Um, he's a great supporter of City College and came to, uh, to support us in the emergency bridge uh, fund ordinance that unfortunately was vetoed by Mayor L London Breed. But um, I would like to introduce uh, Uncle Damien from uh, Us For Us Bay Area. Thank you so much for coming. Follow at usforus.bayarea on Instagram. <laughs> Um, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I want to pay homage and respect and thank the organizers of this event and the people for coming out, taking their time to just show that they care. Uh, my name is Damian Posey. I'm a San Francisco native, born and raised in San Francisco in the Bayview in the Fillmore District. Uh, I'm also uh, a Ram myself, a CCSF <laughs> alumni. I don't know how many credits I got, but I know I got an AA somewhere in there like that, all the classes I've taken. Um, but I'm affectionately known in the community as Uncle Damien. Uh, I'm also the executive director of an organization called Us For Us, which is focused on community action and supporting great uh, organizations that do great things in the community, such as CCSF. You know, and it, it's a shame that we're here right now because all that's going on, the last thing we should be talking about is shutting down schools. Am I right? That's the last thing we should be talking about, you know. There are some other places, you know, because this is a, a peaceful, positive protest. We're going to keep it in that vein. But we know that some people are being overpaid and they're underserving the people. We need to get those funds to the people that are serving the people properly. Like you've seen my young people walked around. We got hand sanitizers and masks, and that's what we do. We've been to 16, 17 protests, you know, as of recently. And that's not why I started the organization to support peaceful protesters but that's what's needed right now so we have to go with what the people need in the time and what the people need right now in this time is education education about uh, racial equality education about you know school disparities education about those old adages that's been going on where we're unfortunately working under a system that's outdated that needs to be reformed I'm not saying we need to totally defund the police. I haven't taken up a position on that. But I do know that some of those funds that they're getting can be allocated to things like this young lady just said for the black student unions over there. That's a shame that they're not even on the roster. Like, come on now. If I was a new student coming to the school and I wanted to find, you know, my people, you know, it would be hard for me to do. You know, even though all of the programs there are good, but you know, people like to be around their people. And once you get around your people, you can learn how to integrate around other people, but you gotta learn about yourself first. And that's what I'm all about, is learning about yourself and what you need to do. And I wanna encourage everybody to do their part. You know, everybody here is doing their part, just holding the space that you're doing because everybody's not meant to go to 1617 protests. You know, I was, if y'all wanna see me, Two months ago, I was a little bit fatter. Now I got a, a protest body now. You know, I'm in shape because I've been working. But that's the space that I've been called to fill. Everybody can't fill that space. Maybe your space is making signs. Maybe your space is praying for the people or making food or donating. We always need donations. These masks and hand sanitizer and waters and snacks and foods and stuff that we bring to the people is not free. You know, we get some lovely donations and we pre all the, appreciate all the donations, but gas and everything, you know, that might be your space. Your space might be to record, like this young lady right here is recording for us. You know, but find your space and fill it. But everybody has to get active. You have to do something because it may not be at your doorstep right now, but tomorrow, the day after, it could be at your doorstep. We're grateful to, see that, it's all about her. That's all, you got something you wanna say? Cause it's all about you, I don't care. She can get up here and talk. You know, I don't mind. I cut it off for the babies, you know. But everybody needs to fill their space because we're blessed to live in San Francisco. We're a little bit more liberal and safer. But if you 
are staying up on the current times in Minnesota and Seattle, man, they having some real martial law going on. The people have taken over the box, like, you know, taking over police stations and saying no more to certain things. There's a little bit of anarchy in some places, you know, so we're here peacefully protesting and we're blessed. But in order to keep that, everybody has to get involved because you might be safe today or tomorrow. But if things keep going the way they're going, it will end up on your door. You know, and I'm, I don't want to be dark or down, but I just want to be real and let you understand. You know, like I said, I was born and raised in San Francisco. You know, these ain't no get it to them all tattoos. I've been through some stuff. You know, I'm from Hunters Point from the Bayview Fillmore. You know, I've been shot five times. You know, I went to prison, I did my time, and I came back. And now for the past 10 years, I've been serving the community. I'm a award-winning mentor. I travel around the country trying to help keep peace and keep people, you know, out of trouble and off the streets and jobs like my young people that I got with me here, you know. And that's what redemption is about and reform is about. And like I said, at the Speak Up and Dribble uh, event, you know, just imagine if instead of getting arrested, I got gunned down by a crooked cop. Then it wouldn't have been none of this. I wouldn't be able here to hopefully inspire somebody to make some change, to sign a petition, to donate to CCSF, to make people aware that we need to keep schools open and not shut them down. We need to shut down some of these crooked offices that's going on. You know what I'm saying? We're not going to talk about, you know, our leadership is not the greatest. I don't know who you voted for, but I know who I didn't vote for, <laughs> you know. So let's educate ourselves first and foremost. That's why it's very important that we support schools because education is the starting point. Then we go to belief and then we go to action. My name is Damian Posey from Us For Us. I appreciate each and every one of y'all. Hello, everybody. Welcome for coming out here today and risking yourselves and your 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 life and liberty to be here. Um, my name is Stephen Brady. I'm one of the faculty. Uh, I work out at Evans Campus, which is out in uh, Hunters, uh, out near uh, Hunters Point, um, the Bayview. Uh, it's uh, uh, we're here really today to talk about the uh, the Fort Mason being shut down. But this this is this is not the only center that's been affected by these cuts and been affected by what's been going on at City College. Um, uh, there's a lot of other centers besides, and the one I want to talk about today is, is the Evans campus where all of our trades are taught, or most of our trades are taught. Uh, I, I teach in the automotive department, but we have construction there, we have carpentry, um, uh, the electricians, plumbers, they all could come through our uh, campus. And you would think that, you know, we've been given a lot of money for, from the state for, for equipment, you know, everything's been modernized. You would think that we'd be the thriving uh, campus in, in, in the college. But actually, over the course of the last few years, uh, some people talked about the ACJC uh, and the accreditation and how the college has been downsized. But the trades, believe it or not, we too have been affected. Since 2016, uh, our, our offerings at, at the Evans campus have been nearly halved in nearly every department. Um, we need people, we, we need transportation, we need housing. Why are these programs being cut? It just does not make sense. Absolutely uh, no, no excuse for it. Um, one of the reasons is when they, when they cut classes, a lot of the time they'll do it just based on numbers. Uh, our classes in particular, they're designed to be small classes. The max that you can have in, in most of our classes are 25 students. Um, the college, though, they expect you to have 20, 22, 23 students if they're going to keep a class going at all. I had a class last, um, um, last fall. I had 15 students enrolled. It was a welding class. Now, we don't have very many welders even. But the point is, they cut that class two weeks before it was about to start. So there was two more weeks that people could sign up to make the 20. But they said, to hell with it, we're just going to cut it now. It's two weeks away. He'll never get another five students. I had three or four students show up on the first day, didn't know it was cancelled. Uh, a lot of uh, our students show up on the first day to sign up for class. They're working students. I went through City College. Uh, 
I did it part time. I did it when I could take a class. I couldn't give up my job to go to college, to go to school. I had to do it piecemeal. And that's the way most of our students want their classes. They don't want it to be a junior college where they have to give everything up to go to class from nine to five. So, so for success stories for people, you know, we need to give them classes all times of the day, weekends, nights, whenever it suits them to come to a class. You know, we've had a lot of uh, talk about Black Lives Matter, and th the very first way we can repair the, the problems that this country has had, the reparations, the very first step is to give people a decent start. Give our minorities a good start to their lives, a good education. Uh, so, with that, I, I, I don't want you guys to come away from here today feeling all gloomy and down. There's a lot of good things happening. Um, there's a couple of ballot measures that are going forward. There's WORF, which is uh, um, the workforce, let me, let me get, get the name right here, Workforce Education Recovery Fund, which is on the ballot in, in November. Um, so, uh, uh, Mar, uh, one of the supervisors of Mar, he is, he's really working hard to get that push through. So, we need everyone to get out and really support that. Another one is schools and communities, which is a state ballot. Um, and what that's going to do is that's going to uh, get some, some of the property taxes. Uh, the companies get a huge tax break here in California. Whatever they bought their building at, they're only allowed to put that up a very, very minuscule amount every year. And as a result of that, they're not paying their fair share of taxes. They reckon there could be maybe as much as 12 to $15 billion that we can get towards education, towards schools and communities that can be reinvested. Um, and, and hopefully next year that will pass and, and we will have that, those funds. They can be used to get our classes back up and running to places like Fort Mason to uh, redouble the classes that we had back um, at the Evans campus. I have colleagues, um, part-time instructors, that work every day and then they come to college to pass on their skills at night to teach people. They've all been laid off. They've all been laid off. Many of them de depend on their job at City College to give them health care. But the skills that they pass on uh, are invaluable and, and can, ha can help our, um, our young people uh, get good, good jobs that pay a good living wage here in San Francisco. So uh, anyway, don't give up hope. Keep um, fighting on. Keep writing to your supervisors. Get your supervisors involved. Uh, let them know. We had a lot of success. Uh, Shaman Walton is our supervisor over, in, in, um, over by Evans. And he's been amazing uh, in the last few ma months fighting for the cause of getting funds for the college um, and, and helping to support the programs at Evans. So, you know, if you can get in touch with your supervisor, tell them, um, you know, tell them your needs, write to them, write to the mayor, and just let them know we're not going to go away. We're here for good. We're going to fight. We're going to get what we deserve. We're going to give these young people a good start. Thank you. Hi. Um I am Ainsley Tilbrook. I have been a student at City College ever since I moved here in the 78. And I've taken an abundance of odd classes, but I have been the volunteer of, um, assistant for the upholstery class at Evans Campus for the last four years. I um, started just by taking the class and loved it so much I kept moving up uh, that, that avenue. Um, I wanted to, I'm here because I want to, I think we need to get ahead of the uh, Evans uh, curve with the potential closure of that campus. I feel that um, not only is education an opportunity for everyone, but the people now, like myself, I was a banquet server for 24 years at the Marriott, and I am not going to have a job. <clears throat> and neither are all my coworkers. I am just, we are just a small drop in the bucket of people who are going to be without work. And we need the school. We need, whether it's to take a class in business to pursue another avenue, 
whether it's to learn a trade, the trades that have been, been cut, cut um, upholstery, we had four classes. What I brought, just as proof, are four pages, 113 students who were either registered or waitlisted for the upholstery class for spring of this year. 113 for three classes. We could only take 25 per class. Students have been clamoring for years to get into upholstery and they cut them not because of the numbers and those students have offered or were willing to pay some fair amount to not have the class cut. And most of those students, including myself, could not afford to take the extension class that they were providing at over $300 for eight classes. So I think this is the Evans campus and the trades and the arts, which are all the, and ESL are all the classes that are being cut. And what, what is, are the, target markets for those the arts it appears that it's a very very important part of a senior lifestyle the trades which are a lot of minorities and working class people who if they take the electrical class they can get a raise in pay there's janitors those classes that are being trained to be janitors it's almost a hundred percent minorities they take the class, they can get a job. They take the class, they, they already have, they're already a janitor at the Marriott. They take this class, they get a raise in pay. We are squashing down working class, all minorities, every single one. It's just wrong and we need, we need more people like ourselves to be here to fight the fight because we can't depend on our board of trustees. As someone mentioned before, we don't, I didn't realize that, we, that these people were not fighting for education. What they're fighting for is their way up the political ladder. It's a starting point. They don't care, they don't want to alienate anyone above them. So we need to fight the fight ourselves and reach out to everyone you know. And I appreciate everyone being here, and thank you. Thank you. No, no, no. Today, I think it's appalling all of the cuts that have happened in any and all of the classes. I think that it's appalling that we've had, we have two sources of structural deficits that have been there for several, uh, at least one decade. I think it's appalling that we have had three years where the budget has been overspent. It's not been overspent on classes because those are the things that have been cut. It's been overspent in travel, in consultancies, and things like that. Now, I was supposed to talk about older adults because I am an older adult. I have to tell you that my mother-in-law, the first time she went to City College, was as an elder because she didn't have the time, she didn't have the luxury as a young woman to go to college. That's true of a lot of our elders who are going to our older adult classes. The other thing I want to tell you, as an experienced uh, dean, as an experienced vice chancellor of instruction, and as an experienced vice president of instruction, you keep your classes like ESL, because those classes, which tend to be larger classes, the older adults classes, which tend to be uh, larger classes, which don't have a lot of cost to them. With ESL, you need a chalkboard, and you need a teacher, and you need a classroom, and you need the students. I know, because I was an ESL teacher. So you keep those classes because those classes earn from the state more than they cost. You use what you earn from those classes to fund the classes that must be smaller, like some of our vocational technical education and some of our art classes that have to be small because of the equipment involved. So I will be one of seven voices on that board. There are four seats that are open. There are two incumbents running and there are a number of us who are not incumbents who are also running, but you have four opportunities to change the board. In two years, you'll have an opportunity to change 
three more seats. So the voters of San Francisco, and you need to talk to your colleagues and your friends. This is not a time just to choose someone because you've seen an attractive poster or they might be endorsed by this politician or that politician. You, you have to have them do the homework and you have to help educate them in terms of what's needed. Now in terms of my own run, I am not running for any other office. I am only running for the Board of Trustees. So I am not obliged to think about what my vote might mean in my political future. I'm doing that in, uh, on purpose. And I hope that as we have more and more faculty who retire, there will be other people who will join us on that board so we can change things. The name of this district officially is the San Francisco Community Community College District. We need to keep the community in the college. We need to hire a new permanent chancellor and the, this board will have that opportunity to do that. I want to be on the board when we hire that chancellor because I want to make sure that we hire a chancellor who is as committed to the vision of City College as all of us here are today. So please, this is an important election for WERF, for the, what, what was the name of the? Communities First. This is an important election. Oh, and by the way, there's a presidential election too. So encourage people to turn out and vote. There are so many changes we need to do. And like others before me, I want to encourage us not to be downhearted. When I was a student at San Francisco State in the 60s, I was one of the ones marching around with my picket sign. Because what happened when I was a student is you could go in the cafeteria and there, you, there would be three tables. All of the African American students would be at one, the Latino students would be at another, the Asian American students would be at another. Very often I was the only student of color in my classes. When I go at San Francisco State today, I look at that wonderful, beautiful, diverse campus. That struggle in the 60s was worth it. Our struggle today is worth it. But we all have to get involved, we have to get our communities involved, and we have to get out there and vote this coming November. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. What a wonderful uh, event we have here. Thank you all for coming out. I want to talk about two different topics today. I'm going to start with the Balboa Reservoir. We're kind of talking about the future of City College. There are threats, and you've heard about some of them. One of them is behind us, trying to save Balboa, uh, Fort Mason. Um, so when I say uh, Balboa Reservoir, um, the issue that we're going to talk about in a minute is 1,100 units of mostly rental, mostly uh, market rate housing that has uh, come, been proposed since 2014. But before talking about that, I'm talking about what is the presence of City College at the Balboa Reservoir, which is like a, um, it's 27 acres of land. The upper level is now owned by City College. The lower level is owned by the PUC. Um, so there's been a long history of the college there. It uh, goes back to 1946 after the war. Uh, they were given the chance to lease the um, Waves barracks. All of a sudden overnight they had 15 buildings, a thousand seat auditorium. And that's what allowed the uh, post uh, war college to thrive. Um, they went back across the street to Cloud Hall um, in 1954. 1957 there was a um, uh, a reservoir actually built and never had water and never had connections to water but it could have had 150 million gallons of water. Uh, 1958 there was parking allowed by the PUC uh, at the North Basin and um, so that's the beginning of the the parking for City College. In the 80s there is a proposal to have uh, 200 units of housing on the south basin and that was defeated by community activism the voters said no and uh, now in uh, the 2014 that's a different story because in 2013 the state took over city college um, 
but there had been some changes. In 1991, there was a uh, land swap, and that gave City College the upper, uh, the upper part of the land. Um, and they later built the MUB. Uh, and in 2012, there was another change. Uh, by the way, there's millions of dollars that the college has spent, and they're just about the only ones uh, changing it around. It used to be a north-south division, now it's east-west. The college is what uh, spent that, that money. Um, so now I want to get to talking a little about the, uh, the yellow uh, resolution. That's from the DCCA, um, to a group to save City College. And the idea is, um, with the last bond measure in March, um, there's an opportunity authorization for the college to buy land. And that uh, resolution says, uh, get the, get the um, trustees to ask the PUC for the land, and not just to give it away, but they will pay, pay what, what is needed. Um, and then there's all kinds of reasons why that should be done, uh, not only the long history uh, with the college, um, but the need to expand. Also, there has to be parking. Um, and uh, when the private developer uh, has made inroads and they're on a fast track tomorrow, uh, tomorrow they have, there's a PUC meeting, a very pivotal one, because that's the one where all the, um, everything that needs to be done before going to the Board of Supervisors will be passed at that time. And they're also going to declare the land surplus and uh, that means that all kinds of things like the privatizing special use district and the developer agreement can be accepted. So uh, please either call them tomorrow or write to the PUC and say that you want uh, the land for the college and not to accept the unfair uh, development. One of the things about that development is the cost for the uh, developer is a 98% discount. When has anybody here had a 98% discount? It's 15.95, I think, per square foot, which is just unheard of. So, and that's secret that just came out last month, and they're not showing us the reasons for it. So there's all kinds. Of, this is a heist or a swindle. So we can't allow it. Uh, now I want to switch to one other topic, which is the Brown Act. The Brown Act was uh, passed in 1954, and it's basically a public meetings act. That's why you'll have agendas posted for your regular meetings 72 hours in advance because of that act. Um, and the pivotal act this year was between the 20th and the 26th of March. The uh, Board of Trustees made a decision to uh, remove Mark Rocha, the controversial uh, and not very popular, though very charismatic, uh, chancellor of the college. But they did it in a kind of a strange way. They met for three hours on the 20th and then came back and said they hadn't decided to do anything. Yet on Monday, the uh, uh, president of the board said, oh, we're removing him. We're putting on paid leave. And then on Thursday at the board meeting, they met in private session and agreed to um, agreed on a settlement for him, which was $340,000. And part of that was because in 2018, they said, um, you know what, he's such a good guy, we're gonna extend his contract by two years. They didn't tell anybody. They weren't supposed to do it. It was a violation of the law, but no one held them to it. Um, so because of those two years extra on his contract, that's why he had a year to be paid off at this time. That's my take on it. Anyway, uh, I and Wynne Kaufman, a um, colleague in the engineering department, um, said there's something not right here. Because um, they were supposed to uh, make their final settlement partly in open session, but they didn't do it. So uh, we filed uh, a month later a, um, a notice saying 
You did that wrong. What you're supposed to do is do it in open session. Meanwhile, take back that money that you offered him, and if you want to, you can do it right. Uh, if you want to off if insist on offering that money, but also give the public, the students, the faculty, the general public, who are maybe not happy about paying this character, um, it came to four hundred thousand dollars altogether. So come out on Thursday. It's a virtual meeting, or send a letter to the board of trustees, uh, because what they have done is la on the eleventh uh, they passed a response to that. Um, uh, the notice of violation, and what they said was, um, they're they are planning to re-ratify the resignation agreement, giving him his award. Um, but they have to take public comments. So if you think maybe that's not the best way to spend four hundred thousand dollars, or if you want the board to know that they can't keep skirting public. Uh, public meeting uh, laws, and they tend, they have a tendency to do it, but um, we shouldn't allow it. And they're only going through this because they blamed me and Wynn Kaufman. <coughs> they said, this is really inconvenient. You know, there might be a lawsuit. Uh, so we're going to go through this measure, and even though we don't think we did anything wrong, we're still going to humbly apologize and on Thursday restage this and give Mark Rocha his money because we don't want him to be deprived. Do we want Mark Rocha to be deprived? Yes, we he did a lot of damage at City College. Do we think the uh, Board of Trustees should do the right thing? Yes, yes we should. Are you going to go out on Thursday? The board meeting is at 4 o'clock. I'm not sure about the time of the uh, public comments but uh, we should make it robust. We should make them there till midnight, hearing from us about what is wrong, uh, how Mark Rocha was responsible for tremendous cuts for the for salary gate, for um, uh, the midnight massacre, uh, for an atmosphere of uh, kind of despair when all the cuts we're hearing about today they're, they're a lot thanks to him. And his policies are being carried on by his acolytes, you know, Tom Bogle and Diana Gonzalez. She's going to go back to her old position, but she was carrying out, this, carrying out the uh, same policies. So that's why we've got to have people like Anita Martinez uh, come in to hold the officials accountable and to represent the voice of the people. So please take one of the yellow uh, resolutions. Uh, if you don't have it already, feel free to talk to me about more details. Um, but faculty and students are out there. We've got some great ones here advocating for all of us. So thank you. more speaker and then we're going to throw it open to anybody who would like to come up so here is another candidate for our new board Thank you so much for having me here today my name is Alia Chisti and I am running for City College Board of Trustees I was born and raised in the city City College of San Francisco transforms lives it transformed my family's life my mom we grew up in poverty. She took ESL classes at night to learn English so that she could better our lives. My brother was a part-time student. He would take classes in the daytime and work a job at nighttime. We are here talking about access today. This is what this is about. This is access. Fort Mason provides access to these spaces that we feel like we're not a part of. I grew up in D11. I can count the number of times I've been to this part of the city. Fort Mason brings other students and other people to this part. I also want to elevate um, some of the demands of the Black Student Union. It is unacceptable that they have to demand a space on campus. That is not what City College is about. Yeah. City College encompasses all of us and so much more. And I, I am so happy to have listened to all of you and learned from all of you. And I will continue to do that. And I also want to echo Anita Martinez's uh, comments. She has been a part of your community for so long. Um, so thank you. <laughs> thank you for having me here and for bringing me into this space and letting me stand in solidarity with you today. Thank you. Oh.
Alia Chesti. Closer, so we have more of a chorus. Um, my name is Pat Wynn. I'm in the Labor Studies Department, but of course I'm not anymore. And I conduct the Bay Area Labor Heritage Rock and Solidarity Chorus. This is Helen from the Music Department as well. Formerly. Formerly. We're all formerly. We shall not, we shall not be moved. We shall not, we shall not be moved. Just like a tree standing by the water. We shall not be moved. We shall not, we shall not be moved. We shall not, we shall not be moved just like a tree standing by the water. We shall not be moved. Art is essential. Art is essential. We shall not be moved. Art is essential. We shall not be moved just like a tree standing by the water. We shall not be moved. Art is essential. We shall not be moved. Art is essential. We shall not be moved just like a tree standing by the water. We shall not be moved. Adult learners. Adult, Adult learners are essential. We shall not be moved. Adult, Adult learners are essential. We shall not be moved just like a tree standing by the water. We shall not be moved. Thank you. <laughs>